I want to be clear about what people want and why they want it. Uh, in, in a democracy, we're in a space where 40% of us want a package of things that the other 60% kind of really, really don't want. And how do we understand each other in that kind of division, politically, socially, sociologically, economically? Um, how do we understand each other well enough to get along as, as neighbors? Um, well, it starts with clarity. And, and that's what we're working on in three practice circles, to give people a space where they can get clear about what their friends and their opponents, their allies and their opponents want and why they want it. Here we are, another episode, and uh, I have some friends to introduce my listeners to. It is Jim Hancock and Jim Henderson. Um, they are the, I guess I call you the founders of Three Practices. Is that a good? Sure, in that we found it. I think you guys could have maybe had different names when you decided to go into so business the old, together. The old guy with the glasses is Jim Henderson. And the other old guy with the glasses is Jim Hancock. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was hoping that you guys could tell me a little bit about your background. Well, our friend Brian Boyle, who is junior to both of us by a couple of decades, swore that we needed to meet each other, that we would really like each other and probably want to do something. And being miserable, old, white, cisgendered, straight farts, we met and thought, well, you know, it's another one. There's another one, it's just like me. <laughs> and it, it took us about two years of just, you know, meeting up from time to time. And Brian Gamely brought us together uh, for meals and, and whatnot. And, and it was fine. Jim's fine. T trust me when I said. <laughs> and then... Jim gets wow. a call from a, a white evangelical pastor in Peoria, Illinois, who says, so I read your book, Jim and Casper Go to Church, which is a book uh, written with uh, Jim Henderson and his friend Matt Casper about what happens when uh, a white sort of semi-evangelical um, meets a, a white atheist and and they start comparing notes about the god the universe and everything and jim powell the guy from peora who called jim henderson said i find myself in a similar situation of of hanging out with and becoming friends with and then becoming really good friends with a uh, uh, with an imam here in my town with whom i share a parking lot and a rabbi here in town who is going around making trouble and he put the two of us together and now we can't get separate. We've known each other for five years now. Uh, we, we love each other. We respect each other. We trust each other. We don't worship with each other, right? We don't preach at each other's churches, but we like each other as, as human beings. And we wondered if you would help us write a book like you and Matt Casper, your atheist friend wrote years ago, to which Jim said something like, That's a great idea, but could we make a movie too? Because I had been, um, I had been thinking about documentary movies, knowing nothing about them other than that I admired and respected the people who made them. And at that point I had met Jim Hancock and that's the kind of work he did. And Brian did that. So a lot of what I do is I find excuses to bring people together that I like. So I'll find a project and maybe it turns into something, but at least we have fun on the way through. So they agreed to do a book and a documentary movie. So then we ended up doing that movie about these three clergy people in Peoria called No Joke. And as a result of that, um, at the same time introduced 
what we now call three practices into the project. We traveled with them, with the movie, doing uh, screenings, et cetera. And we decided we wanted to um, actually expose people to what these three clergy people had been doing without knowing what it was called. So we asked for their permission to use three practice language. They agreed to that. And um, we traveled and did events with them. And uh, basically what emerged out of that is uh, people were more interested in the three practice than in the three practitioners hmm. uh, and wanted to know how they could do it themselves. That's a quick way of saying it. And <clears throat> so we realized that we needed to figure out how to take it public. How do we, how do we operationalize this thing? So we had the language, but we didn't have a mechanism. And then that led to Jim and I then, I would say about three years ago, I just, I'm sorry, Jim, maybe it's longer, um, starting testing three practice circles and bending three practice circles as a way of helping other people figure out how to do what they were doing. So it's kind of like if you went and heard a band play and you thought, that's great, but can I play in the band too? Right. And so we wanted to help people not just listen to people, but actually be the band. And that was the beginning of what now has developed into a three practice circles and the, I, I think it's safe to call it something of a movement that's occurring uh, around that. Okay. So, yes. so you started um, with those three gentlemen and they were the ones, only ones talking then at first and other people, they really liked it and they wanted to participate. Then you started doing them in person. And then let, let me try and re-steer that just, just let me try yeah. and re-steer that just a, a hair if I may. <clears throat> so we met them in the middle of 2016 during the 26, 2016 election cycle, right? And um, the reason, part of the reason that they wanted to go public with their story is that they become really close friends, like protective of each other and each other's families. And anti-Muslim sentiment was growing rapidly and hate crimes were beginning to spring up around the Peoria uh, community, which has the highest concentration of Muslims in all of Illinois because of Caterpillar, uh, the, uh, the, which has hired lots and lots of engineers from around the world because uh, of it being a regional medical center who brought in lots and lots of physicians, again, from, uh, from around the world. And so in, this, in that space, there were some folks who took exception to that. Uh, that county in, includes towns that back in the day were uh, were in the Green Book. And, you know, that book that, that was published, uh, that booklet that was published to help Black uh, U.S. travelers understand towns that they should steer away from uh, because uh, there were racist police officers and there was no place to get a motel and you couldn't eat in that town and you might even get in trouble trying to get gas in that town. And there were sundown towns that had as a piece of their... Uh, of their cultural sort of moment to say we want all people of color not the word that they, they not the phrase they would have used out of this town by sundown uh, or it whatever happens is on you so a town with a with a strong racist uh, a county with a strong racist past um, and uh, almost all of the of the muslims uh, in that part of uh, of america were brown-skinned people and so it was a combination of the uh, anti-Muslim sentiment that grew out of uh, the 9-11 catastrophe and, and beyond. Uh, and a catastrophe is too strong, too, too weak a word, right? There was, a, was, was an assault, it was an attack. And nobody was clearer about that than American Muslims who condemned that in no uncertain terms, right? including our, our new Imam friends, knew it at the time, uh, uh, Imam Kamil Mufti. So we agreed, as Jim described, to, uh, to tell their story if we believed them. And we went and spent seven days with them. Uh, and we talked with them for hours and hours and hours, individually and as a, as a threesome. And we recorded all of that. And then we went and talked to people from their congregations and people in city government and a, a, US member, a member of US Congress uh, for their district and educators and people of influence all across uh, the space. And we came away with the conclusion that either everybody was in on it or these guys really were friends and that they really were having an effect on the, on the climate 
in greater Peoria by drawing people together. Meanwhile, um, Jim and I in, in parallel lives had been working to help people find safe spaces to talk about unsafe things. And we had been working on the question of what is it that makes people cross the differences between themselves and others repeatedly and on purpose, right? Not the accidental thing where you find yourself snuck in a snowstorm and stuck in a snowstorm <laughs> in a bus station or at a roadside rest or whatever, and you find yourself talking to people who are very unlike you and you end the, the night saying, oh, it's not such a bad chat, but I, you know, I'm one of the good ones apparently, right? But on purpose, people saying, I'm going to, I'm going to know this person who I've always thought of as the other, and I'm going to I'm going to continue down that that road to try to understand um, who they are and what they want and why they will want those things. And we brought our thinking, which was in parallel, right? It wasn't the same thing, uh, but it was similar enough that when Jim used the phrase three practices and described language around that, I said, yep, that's what I've been working on, too. Not in those words. But we then decided that we would test uh, our interviews with these three guys to see if what we thought we were seeing out in the real world was, in fact, what they were doing in Peoria, Illinois. What do you remember about that, Jim? So one of the things you'll pick up on is that Jim and I both test things. Um, he's much more organized and structured about it, but I'm sort of uh, persistent about it as well. I don't mind trying ideas out in public to see if they really can stand up, you know, without being protected or shielded. And so that's one of the things we have in common was this desire to like to try an idea in the real world. Um, and yeah, what Jim gave you much more detail there about sort of the, the story behind the story, the richness of what was coming out of it. And it's a beautiful, powerful story uh, that gave us then a, really a rich environment to to um, put our ideas to the test. <clears throat> so then when we um, we then screened the movie, as I was saying, it became evident that people liked these guys, but there was also problems just on moving everybody around, uh, getting everybody in the same location, same time to do events. And it became clear that, you know, Jim and I were interested in uh, essentially what we'd call scaling an idea. Um, we had, uh, it just interested us. I wonder if this is something the ordinary people could do. So this idea of doing things on purpose, that's not language most people are going to call out because they just think it's awesome when you do it by accident. <laughs> and so we, we think it's awesome when you can do it on purpose and repeat it. But that becomes, a, that's a new set of problems. You're an engineer, so you understand all the different pieces you have to like bring together <clears throat> that you stress test an idea. And uh, so in the real world, how do you get an idea so that people can embrace it quickly? Uh, meaningfully and, and practice it consistently so that it's good enough for them to take them take themselves and try themselves. So that was, again, we had a lot of, uh, Jim and I had a lot of similar interests. We had probably because of our age is, <laughs> we had what I call gotten over ourselves and to a great degree, meaning neither of us cared about getting our way totally. And, and we understood um, how to collaborate but that was because of time. We both had been uh, had our had our sufficient failures and the hard knocks, and understood what, how difficult it was to get an idea embraced. We just knew that, and so for some reason, we were both at a place in life where we found it interesting to try and work on something together. So um, I've never really worked with someone as close as I have with Jim since I was nineteen. Um, I'm very private about my creative side of things, which is not something I, I'm proud of. <laughs> and it's clearly <laughs> evident because not much has ever really happened in that regard. Uh, so for me, it's been just a phenomenal opportunity to work with somebody to co-create something. And um, so that's, that's really what's interesting on the creative side, how we've gotten to explore that for me. And I, I, don't know how much of that is Jim's story on that side, but for me, it's been, uh, you know, significant. And so we're really interested in giving people a tool to use, not just being speakers. 
not just being the experts about look at us. We both produce people like that. We've had, done some of that ourselves. And we know it simply is not going to change, move the needle much if, unless people have a thing they can do, they can participate. And so we're both interested in that. So that really informs a lot about what's motivated us to get to this part about what we call three practice circles now. So over the weekend, I was uh, with the rabbi uh, who, who now lives in St. Louis. And uh, we had a lovely uh, visit to hang out. And um, he said, I, I'm not sure. I've kind of lost faith that a lot of people can do exactly what we did meaning him and the, and the imam and, and the preacher, uh, that, that a lot of people are able to follow through with, with building that kind of, uh, of relationship based on mutual um, trust and, and love. I said, but I, but I do love the three practices. I, I took away from the project that description of what it was that we had been doing. And, and we, we didn't spring it on them exactly, but we, we showed them the first cut of the movie, which we said, we think this is is what you did and and we think this is uh the language we think these, these are the practices that you describe in different language and and they they all agree and and now five years later uh rabbi bogart says that's that's what i still have going with me i still use that language to help people understand uh, what it means to, to cross the difference divide and that was the thing that people liked most about the, the, the screenings that we did, no matter whether we showed a 30 minute cut down version that was just three practices in, in those, guys, those guys' words, or the whole hour and a half um, documentary feature length film, people wanted to know, can I take this home? Can I do something with this where I live and, and with the people I, I live with? And that was what drove us uh, to, to start testing the question in, um, in in cafes and church basements and college halls, uh, uh, just to, to, to see could we build a way for people to work out together around the three practices, which I'm sure you have something to say about because you probably know what those three practices are. What are the three practices? The three practices are... I will be unusually interested in others. That's practice one. Unusually interested in others. Practice two, I'll stay in the room with difference. I won't run away. Practice three, I'll stop comparing my best with your worst. Stop comparing my best with your worst. Or as they cool. say in Europe, three practices, not three practices. Okay, I want to do a little demo. I thought that would be the best way to describe what the rules are. So I want to, the, if you go into a three practice circle, it is, there are different formats, but the most common one is you come into the room with a framing question and, and some volunteers talk and it will go something like this. What do we lose when we compromise? Okay. Good uh, uh, oh, I get to go first. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> uh, when I compromise, I, I give up uh, the... Uh, the option to appear to be right because I have the last word. And I grew up uh, believing that that was uh, important, that uh, that seeming to win the argument, uh, even if it was only to mutter, oh, huh, what was still a win. And that it had nothing to do with understanding, uh, let alone uh, such a simple task as, as clarity because clarity has never, had never in my growing up years been a priority for me uh, of any sort. Um, I, I wanted to uh, believe what I believed and, and the idea of, of compromise would suggest that somebody else could be as right as me about something or that we would split the difference and both be partly wrong. And, and uh, I grew up in a culture where people like me were uh, intent upon being 100% right 100% of the time. And we were frequently, I was frequently privileged to in conversations that way uh, with women and, and girls, uh, with people of color, um, straight white Christian men in the culture where, where I grew up uh, were privileged 
to uh, to control conversations uh, from uh, from the subject to the conclusion. Um, did that mean we actually won anything? No, it was all all theater. Um, but compromising is surrendering the, the possibility of, of, uh, of being the star. Um, the other side of that uh, is what we win by compromising, but that's a story for another day. Yeah, you go, go ahead. Jeff. I'd be curious to know, can I ask and I'd be curious to know? Yes, that's I'd how be, you should I'd do I'd be curious to know, Jim, um, what did you lose um, upon reflection, looking back on that, what were you losing as a human being by holding that standard of being 100% right 100% of the time? I'd be curious to know. Yeah, well, I, th I think that what I lost was a grip on reality. Um, the idea that I could just drone on and on and on and on um, it became a, a, a refuge from facts, right? from ever having my mind changed by facts. Um, my perceptions became uh, became the most important thing in the air at any any point. So that damaged my relationships uh, with with friends. It made me uh, uh, prickly and not uh, not a very good uh, play date. Uh, it, it damaged my relationship uh, with with women and it, it, you know, girls when when it all started, um, and it put me in a, in a space where. A lot, uh, a lot to unlearn uh, when I got married, um, and a lot to to grapple with in order to uh, to, to become a partner uh, to my spouse. That was an awesome answer. I'd be as a follow up. I'd be curious to know um, your opinion of the role religion plays in fostering this attitude in our lives. Yeah. Well, the writer Anne Lamott has a line that uh, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. And I was raised on certainty, raised uh, religiously to believe uh, that, um, that my tribe knew some things that nobody else knew and that we were uh, charged with convincing everybody that we were right and, and they were wrong. Um, our Bibles were uh, about 100 pages long, right? We just kept looping back around <clears throat> over and over again to the things that we liked and, and that made us feel correct and right in the world. And, and uh, we would use uh, those 100 pages to, to produce little paper cuts on people, right? To, just uh, nicking away at them uh, with what, what about is them? Yeah, well, what about... And they never thought about our 100 pages, so they didn't have an answer right on the spot. So I always left those conversations feeling vindicated and right. I'd be curious to know what, um, like without that certainty, if you still have a good pushing off block, if that makes sense, like to direct yourself without knowing exactly what you want in your life or knowing for certain what's good and bad, what's right or wrong. That makes Jim, sense. Do you understand the question, Jim? I would love it if you could uh, ask that question about half as many words. Yeah, I'd be <laughs> curious to know. I'd be curious to know without certainty what it is that propels you, what motivates you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, discovery propels me. Um, uh, experience pr propels me moving around in the world. Uh, there was a three-factor circle recently where the framing question was, um, my... Uh, my self-perception, I'm not, I'm not saying it right, but basically my self-perception was secure until, um, and I didn't, get to, did, I didn't get to go to that circle, but I knew what I would talk about, that my, my self-perception was secure until I started to move around a little bit and, and travel a little bit and talk to people who weren't like me a little bit and realized that our worldviews are built uh, upon where we stand at a particular moment. And I look out at the view and I say, ah, this is what it is. And, it, and that's exactly what it is until I take one step to my right and it's a little bit different or two steps to my left and it's a little bit different or, or step back or up or over or down. As soon as I get into the thing, I realize that what I thought I was certain about was a perception rather than a fact. I'd be curious to know if there is anything that 
you've seen that has remained constant with every position you've been in? Yeah, well, sure. yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I think the, the, the constant for me is, um, is love, is that too, too soft a skill? Um, it is that um, it, it, it seems to me that if anything is true about that religious dogma that I was talking about a few moments ago, if any of it's true, the central piece of it that, that is true um, is, is that we're somehow created in the image of God and loved by God and called upon to love each other um, as if the other were our own selves. And um, I love to be listened to, and I, I think um, by the transitive property that you probably do too, and Jim probably does too, and that everybody in me probably loves to be listened to and heard. Uh, I love to be respected, and by the transitive property, I expect that everybody loves to be respected. And so finding a way to order my life around that love is a constant. Thank you. Thank you, Marty Lynn. One yeah, I'll go real quick. So, you want to two, oh, you want to take two minutes? You ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go. All right, All right. So, well, I've been. I think about this a lot. Okay, what do we lose when we compromise? And I feel like, um, I feel like that it it's hard because people have values and they feel like when they are uh, compromising their values, that is not good. But what I've noticed as far as three practices goes, you don't have to compromise your values to listen. You can actually understand other people without compromising your values. So that's one thing. And another thought I had as Jim was talking about, I was thinking about where I'm at and I'm like, I, I feel like it's a balance. Um, there are things that seem constant, but it can't ever be so solid that it, it, you can't update it if it's wrong. But you do have like a best guess and you're kind of taking steps in faith, I guess, to you're hoping that you're on solid ground. You're, you're, you're stepping on what you think is right, but never so solid that you can't update it if you find out you're wrong, I guess. But it, it's like, I don't know, it's just been a balance, balancing game. This whole experience of me leaving the church I've, that's something I've it comes up everywhere just balance like you can't go too far this way you can't go too far that way it's some kind of balance so anyway that's about all Good. so thank you Margolin. I'd be curious to know um, if you can recall some moments where you felt like um, the balance was unattainable recently um i don't know that i i haven't found i haven't lost hope that it's not attainable it's just that it's foggy and i can't figure out what it is is maybe how i would describe it um i've i've felt like even with like even having conversations with people I am never really sure if you should always say everything you think or if you should keep some of that to yourself. Like, where's the balance there even? So I don't know. There's, there's a lot of places where I, I haven't figured that out. And I think, I think the problem is I'm looking for a rule. I'm an engineer. I want the rule. You tell me how it goes and I want the rule. And it, I think it does change depending on interaction from interaction. It changes from moment to moment. I might not be able to handle something one time. My conversation partner might not be able to handle something at one time. And I think that's what's hard about it. It changes. Thank you. Jim, do you have a follow-up? I do have a follow-up. I'd be curious to know how the engineer in you um, works with the architect in you or near you um, who is basing things, who's basing some things not upon everything being a principle, but on some things being aesthetic compromises. Huh. Yeah, that's something I've, I've, I have to say that I've learned 
I was very legalistic in the way I was um, practicing my religion. And I've noticed there's a lot of people in faith that actually are more artistic in their belief. <laughs> and it's something I've um, had to appreciate recently, like art and music and stuff. Like it's not just that, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to quite, it, it's been new. I've, I've noticed it lately, I would say, and I'm trying to appreciate it, but yeah, to answer your question at all. <laughs> Marjolyn, I'd be curious to know if what you experience when you're trying to answer a question like Jim just asked you. Um, I don't know. I... I'm trying to think of the right words to say, I don't know. <laughs> Can you ask, uh, ask again? I'd be curious to know if how your perception of faith has changed. Uh, is it mostly a verb or mostly a noun? Um, faith. Yeah, it would it would be a verb, I guess, right? It's an action thing. You're taking action based on it's changed. It used to be basically synonymous with certainty. <laughs> but not like you're not something you can't be certain about, but you're just gonna be certain about it anyway. <laughs> That's what it used to mean. And now it means I really not sure about this, but I have faith that if I do it, it will have a good outcome. Yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, there's a couple rounds that, that give you enough to. Yeah, we can do that unless you have something. You have a burning question. I, no, no, I want you to drive the thing. Go, go where you want to. I mean, I'm happy to, but let's go where you want to go. You're the, you're the. You're All right. Well, I do have a few questions now that. Okay, that's this is three practices. You guys have been doing this for. A few years now. What motivates you to continue? Has it been successful? I, I go to these, these three practice circles, right? And, and in the circle, somebody gets to take two minutes, just like we just did, to share a belief or a conviction or an opinion or tell a story, right? Or lay out evidence or, or an argument. And everybody listens. And, and when we first started this, we gave people three minutes and nobody could fill three minutes when they knew they weren't gonna be interrupted, right? So we dropped it back to two and most of the time people get it said in 90 seconds, as you just did, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they kind of get to the end of their two minutes and, and, and they don't say this exactly, but the attitude is, you know, that's all I got. Either it's all the time I've got or it's all the ideas I've got or, or whatever. And then the circle says, in essence, is it though? And then starts asking questions. I'd be curious to know where you learned that. I'd be curious to know how that's working out for you. I'd be curious to know why you think that's no longer, well, why you no longer think that's true, right? Drawing the, the, the person out so that their two minutes turns into five minutes. Uh, occasionally in a story circle, it'll turn into 10 or 12 or one time 18 minutes as people were weeping and laughing and, and just wanted to hear the story that only this person could tell because he was the only one who'd lived it, right? Um, those experiences draw me back over and over again into three practice circles, not just as a three practice ref, uh, but as a participant to, to sit and hear people's opinions and beliefs and convictions and stories and, and, and draw more out of them because I want to be clear about what people want and why they want it. Uh, in, in a democracy, we're in a space where 40% of us want a package of things that the other 60% kind of really, really don't want. And how do we understand each other in that kind of division, politically, socially, sociologically, economically, um, how do we understand each other well enough to get along as, as neighbors? Um, well, it starts with clarity. And, and that's what we're working on in three practice circles, to give people a space where they can get clear about what their friends and their opponents 
their allies and their opponents want and why they want it and what they plan to do if they get it. Uh, the clearer we are about that, the better understanding we have not only of each other, but about how we ought to treat each other. Right? Sometimes I, I get clear enough about what somebody really wants to think, oh, I need to defeat that person at the ballot box. I need, they're dangerous. They, they mean harm to people I love. Uh, other times it's just, oh, wow, that, that sounds painful. I did not know that about you. Mm -hmm. And it may be the individual or maybe some uh, ideological thread that that individual represents in, in the wider society. And what's true in the United States and our cultures is true globally as we experience this with people who live in really different time zones. Yeah. Yep. Did you have anything? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious about what's real. Like what's actually real um, about life and about our world. I'm curious sociologically, sociologically, uh, principally about how human beings work and why they do the things they do. I'm curious about why human beings change their minds, what prompts that to happen. Uh, but, but sincerely, like the real thing, not the, not just, not just the, the marketing, uh, just because an idea looks like it's winning. Cause uh, what, what is it that, why do people embrace, how do, how do they embrace ideas and big ideas? And, and, uh, and I want to know what works, you know, like I like our chances with three practice circles because we just did one, no fanfare. What we do, we held up a clock. At, we, we all knew the rules. Do it anywhere. Yeah. You could do it anywhere. And uh, I just like our chances when it, when something can travel like that. It's durable. It's portable. It's it's like uh, a utility. It's like a, we call it a safety pin or a a, a, a cup or a, you know a, something basic like it's sort of invisible until you need. It. It's like oh, where is that thing? I, I like I like creating a utility that enables people to change you know, if, if they want to. Um, so I'm interested in sociology. I'm also interested in what's real spiritually. You know, we, we're, we're all, I mean, we, three of us, and then many of the people we hang out with have spent a great deal of our adult lives making a bet, you know, about on something. Like you said, we try and be certain about certainty, you know, I mean, try and, and it's the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and, uh, well, what's, what's real? Well, we don't, we don't, that's a question we don't know because faith is, I don't know. Faith is I put my trust in, I hope. Uh, I'm comfortable saying I'm placing a bet. Um, and I also am comfortable saying I might be wrong. And I like living that way, free, you know, to test an idea and not feeling like my eternal salvation is dependent upon me getting something right. I find that ludicrous that if there's a God who made a tree, why would that God ever, you know, be interested in a church service? Seriously, honestly. I mean, it's just like the creativity is just, believes me, bereft. Uh, and why would God, you know, be worried about what I'm thinking, you know, at some point in time? Like, as if that's the big thing that's important to do in life. So uh, my, I, my fascination with Jesus is rooted in, in uh, it's really a religious, I think, my, my bet, my hunch is that Jesus is the only God who ever lived and uh, whoever was real. This is, I could, as, believe me, I know how to throw this language around. I could be completely wrong. And I'm incredibly orthodox, more than most Christians, frankly, in this point. I'm a Trinitarian. I believe Jesus is real. Um, and like I said, I could be wrong about this, but I like my chances based on my observation of the world because that forced me then to say, well, why would I place my bet on Jesus? Well, because I believe that Jesus did not die on the cross to get us to heaven. He died on the cross as a result of coming to a world that's messed up and sick and broken and uh, as a, a way of identifying with us. And that, uh, that what he really came to do is introduce a new way of being human. So forget about religion. Forget about it. You know, he came to introduce a new way of being human. And uh, so if that's true, then how do we help people do that? So... I like living my life intentionally on purpose, overtly about what I just said to you. 
Uh, and so three practices is very much for me an expression of what I observe in the life of Jesus. And uh, it gives me a platform if somebody's interested in saying that, you know, and I don't care if they believe it or they get there another way. It means nothing other than let's all get there. Uh, so I think those things. So, um, I mean, ultimately then, um, uh, for me, three practice circles is a way of testing our hypothesis that we believe, we have a hunch that it's when people like each other, the rules change. It's just a fascinating observation to make about human beings. And when that happens, they not only like each other, sometimes they fall in love with each other. Sometimes they make sacrifices for each other. Sometimes they understand each other. So it's very, um, it's very practical for me. It's very measurable. It's observable. It, I can watch it happen in people's behavior. Uh, and other people can pick it up. And it, it doesn't, I don't have to be the expert. I just think anything where everybody's dependent on me is a very weak, very weak system. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, you know, this is where the incarnation comes in, where we hide ourselves. We hide that thing that God gave us and we disappear and it comes, we get into the life with other people. So I hope some of that makes sense. That's how I make sense of three practices and why, I'm in it. That's awesome. So Can I ask for one more, more, one more yes, temper on ahead. that fire, one more piece of wood on that fire. In 1994, um, Rwandans killed about 900,000 of their neighbors um, in, in the springtime in a period of just about a month. And that killing was sparked and it was fueled and it was sustained by people on talk radio who spoke with absolute certainty that, that one of the tribal groups in Rwanda uh, were, were, were demons, right? Were, were so evil that they needed to be stamped out. And not only were those people um, in need of extinction, but so also were the members of the other tribal group who didn't agree that those people should be destroyed. Hmm. So that 900,000 people who were killed included not only folks of, of, of the other tribe, but also people of the same tribe who just weren't mad enough and were, were considered to be race traitors, basically. Right? Certainty drove that. And it was among the, the worst cultural uh, obscenities recorded in, in human history. If we get locked into certainty, that means we can't compromise with each other on anything because of the people who disagree with us or who don't agree with us one fucking hundred percent are evil and need to be destroyed, then we end up retelling that story. And I'm not, I'm not willing to, to live with that as a cultural possibility for my country or any other country in the world if I can do anything about it. Great. So that being said, is there anything that discourages you when you're on this endeavor? You just so beautifully laid out the reasons to do it, do you ever get discouraged or, and why, if you do? Oh, I get discouraged, I mean, at least every other day. Um, but again, I mean, the benefit of my age is like, I have a strategic advantage over people that are younger because I'm running out of time. So I really don't have time to be discouraged. I mean, I've already lived through multiple discouragements and other things. So I know the feeling in my body when it happens and I'm not as afraid of it. Uh, I don't pay attention to it as much. So, you know, that just comes with time, Marty Lynn. You just, and you know, if you're lucky to get focused earlier in life, I, I wasn't, but if you're lucky to get focused earlier in life, you know, you can get to it quicker maybe. Uh, and you just, you learn to live with uh, discouragement and just keep going anyway. Uh, there's nothing about the actual work or like, I would say um, this is probably the first time in my life that I'm fearless 
about a, a product or a process that we've created. Like I, I'm happy to explain this to anyone. I'm happy to try and persuade them. I don't have any need for anybody to do this, you know, to make meaning for myself. <clears throat> but I like, I really like the durability of the product and the process. I just, I love it. I love watching people do what we just did very simply and seeing how delightful it is that people pay attention to you, Marty Lynn, and, and be curious, genuinely curious about, you know, the, what you're going through in life. It's just nothing bad about it. So, uh, so I'm not discouraged about the process of the product. Um, but it's just, it's just the idea, one decision we made that's different is that we decided to, to run a business and not be a nonprofit. So in our past lives, we would have raised money from people and foundations and donors and so on. Um, and we decided this time, we just wanted to actually create a process and a product that the public would either buy or not buy. By that, I mean, pay for training and so on, like we do. Um, and so that, uh, I mean, if there's any discouragement, it's just, you know, not being smart enough, cool enough, hip enough, and, you know, to get to the market and just keep plugging away. So, but this, we're not stopping because of that. That's just what happens when you have an idea in mind, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, the reason we made that business decision was that we wanted to learn early and often whether we were adding value, right? If we're not adding value and we're not for profit, we can go raise money by telling people apocalyptic stories about how the world's falling apart unless they give money to three practice circles. And that's really different. That's a really different, that's a manipulation rather than a value proposition. And we wanted to be held to the, to the, uh, to the discipline of creating real value that that could be measured because people said, "Yep, I'll I'll do that. I'll pay I'll pay for that. I'll be part of that." Um, when I feel discouraged, it's because um, of our inability to to get it one hundred percent right every time. Um, it, it, it's my acknowledgement that there are times when I haven't told the story uh, well enough to convince even, even a true believer, right? Even somebody who, who has been through the training and is a certified through practice leader that it's worth her while to, to go find a group of people and talk about something uh, that is dividing us, uh, something that is a difference, maybe not even, even a dispute, but a, enough of a difference that it keeps people from being real with each other. Um, and that frustration also drives uh, the iterative culture that Jim and I have uh, held ourselves to and that we will hold ourselves to and, until we're done, that we will iterate until we die, that we will keep working at this uh, until it either uh, gains critical mass and launches uh, right, on a wide scale or, or we die and, and somebody else either says, man, it was a nice run or, Hey, wait a minute, we're picking this up ourselves and, and going with it. Yeah. Um, highlights. Highlights of your your project. Some like you don't have to have your very favorite, just any highlight that comes to mind. Just <laughs> something that is you just love. For me, it, it's a highlight every time a a culturally marginalized person finds her voice or his voice or their voice and, and gives us their opinion and answers our questions or tells us their story and answers our, our question and feels safe and free to do that uh, in, a, in a space that um, would not appear necessarily to be welcoming to people who are already marginalized. Um, so we have been in some circles together, Marty Lynn, where people have told us stories, given us opinions, and we thought, you know, as, as a white person, I've never heard that before um, from, from a, a person of color. As a man, I, I've said even more often, I, I haven't heard a woman tell that truth before. Um, mm -hmm. And those are moments that are genuinely transcendent to me to have created a space that is safe and fair enough that people can find their voice and, and speak truth to privilege. 
right? We don't have a lot of power in mean, three practice circles. We don't even say who we are, right? We just say our names. We don't we don't ever put Dr. So and so on or Reverend So and so on our our name tags. It's just Jim and Jim and Marty Lev and and then on through. But speaking the truth to privilege is letting people uh, understand, letting people who are in some way uh, the, 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 the recipients of unearned advantage in the culture, hear some things that they missed until that moment. And we get a chance to make some decisions um, because the voice of somebody else has been centered in that. And we've become accountable for uh, what we've heard from those people. That's a big, big deal to me. That's awesome. Um, piggybacking on that, I would say a highlight for me is watching people's eyes light up uh, when they either have a moment of self-reflection, uh, self-deprecation, uh, um, delight that they actually got to hear somebody say something they would normally not hear. Um, a highlight for me is that I get to know oftentimes where people are coming from, their backgrounds, the degree of difficulty that they're have, going to have in the circle before they know it, watching them navigate it. And nobody else knows what's going on, but I know their either their religious background, how rare it is for something to be happening. Um, I know people who are more conservative oftentimes and who are more liberal. That's a delight for me to watch them find delight in each other uh, and sometimes don't know the other person's uh, location in life politically or religiously. I just happen to get a lot of a big kick out of that. I think it's funny and uh, uh, humorous and, and uh, I think it's, it sets the undercurrent of how people change um, people start liking each other. Um, I'm honored by people like you who trust us enough to participate and to try this thing and maybe consider using it in their own life and their own work, particularly honored when young people uh, do that. Um, so those are those. And I'm, I, I mean, I need to tell you, I'm honored that to be working with Jim Hancock. Uh, I mean, you can see you know, in the way that we respond, the different ways that we go about making sense out of what we do. And I appreciate his, his way of being able to articulate, in my opinion, more thoughtfully than I can, you know, what we do and, um, and capturing it in a way that makes it accessible to people. Uh, and I, I, you know, when you originally talked about compromise, I thought, the other side of this fear of compromise, I'm exceedingly familiar with that feeling, by the way, you know, I think anybody worth their salt has at least gone through a season of like being super certain of something, <laughs> you know, and like, otherwise you don't know what a, what a mess it is, you know, uh, and letting that go and letting the fear of I'm now I'm bending too much and all of that. Uh, the other side of that is collaboration and uh, the, 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 the melding in with someone else, uh, their ideas and, and watching, um, you know, the beauty of what can happen uh, around that. So that's the other side of compromise is the opportunity to collaborate. So I'm grateful, I'm, I said, I'm, uh, you know, I'm delighted by that to be able to do that with Jim. So those are the things that I'm most delighted by. Yeah, and we, we compromise every day with each other, right? Because we're not the same person. Right. And, and we don't resent each other for that, which is something that I, would, that I did resent about people with whom I have collaborated in the past. Not all of them and not all of the time, right? But I will, my first choice is a mirror, right? <laughs> Somebody who will think what I think, say what I say, make the same motions I make, and, and we match up. And that's not Jim Henderson. For me, right? Uh, so we find a way to do something worth doing, and it's almost better every time. Uh, almost every it time, it is better. better. How about that? Than than if either of us had done it by ourselves. I, I pitched Jim an idea like yesterday or the day before <laughs> that I was convinced was awesome. You know, but I, I mean, I kind of and I said, "What do you think?" He said, "Well, if we do that." 
<laughs> he basically said, we're going to go out of business. <laughs> well, it just so happens that another friend of mine, whom I respect, said something similar, not just directly. And I thought, shit. Darn it. I got to listen yeah. to these people or I'm screwed. Well, we need each other, don't we? Right? I mean, that, that's, yes, what, we do. that's what it comes down to. The lesson of a lifetime is to realize that autonomy is not anywhere near what it's cracked up to me. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I want to be respectful of your guys' time. I did have some quotes I wanted to read through. Um, I don't know if you have 10 more minutes. We do. I do. Jimmy yeah, did, 12 but, uh, more minutes if, if you're willing to tell us highlights for you in this process. Exactly. Okay. I would say you guys touched on some. Um, there have been some circles where you can just tell there's two people, they think they understand the other person, they think they know who that other person is, and you can tell they've been surprised, and they realize that, oh, that's not who I thought it was. You can see it happening in a circle. Beautiful. This rings very, very true to me, and you guys have this in your book, too. Uh, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. And that was uh, David Osberger that wrote that. Um, yeah, I first came in and I was skeptical that anybody cared what I thought. Um, and I was shocked when people actually had genuinely curious questions. So I felt heard and I felt loved. And so that's another thing I like about the circles is um, people like really to, do. Go I'd ahead. like to suggest this should be put in the Bible. This particular quote should be like, <laughs> you play some other bads, some other bad saying, let's put David in there. Anyway, it's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can... in, in, uh, my first, uh, in my first career, I was a youth worker, uh, working on uh, with adolescents and, and families. And um, when I read this line from Augsburger, um, I thought, exactly, you just said better what I've been trying to say uh, to, to parents when I say if, if kids aren't listened to by the people they love, they will come to love the people who listen to them. Hmm. Very good. Very good, Judge. So uh, I, I really like Jonathan Haidt's work, and so I had this in here. <laughs> so I'm going to read the quote, and then I'm going to I emphasize some here for listeners that can't, um, that are on the podcast, but if you really want to change someone's mind on a moral or political matter, you'll need to see things from that person's angle as well as your own. And if you do truly see it, um, see it the other, Perfect. the other, yeah, the other person's way deeply and intuitively, you might even find your own mind opening in response. Empathy is an antidote to righteousness although it's very difficult to empathize across across a, a moral divide. Um, I think sometimes a person will read this quote and they'll say, wow, yeah, if they would just truly listen to me, then they would change their mind. And they forget about this part, like you might even find your own mind opening in response. And I think no matter where we're at, I I, I've, I've, as I've been going through this and the things that have been motivating me is like my own self improvement and wisdom making. Like I want to be more wise. I want to be open minded. I want to try to learn something. It's not so much that I'm trying to convince other people to think like me. Let me say that um, I really hope you keep Jonathan Haidt as a friend your entire life as a thinker, maybe you'll get to hear him or meet him someday. But I, uh, I started following him about 10, 12 years ago. And I think he's one of the most lucid uh, thinkers. Uh, and his, so really good, really good uh, thinking partner to keep close. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanna say, and then Jim will fix this is, uh, um, Empathy is an antidote to righteousness that's very difficult to empathize across the moral divide, which is why we don't actually claim people will experience empathy in a three practice circle. We, we had to learn this um, because this sentence is quite a high standard. Um, 
quite a high standard and we experientially know what he's talking about but we cannot promise that to people because we can't control people's minds and hearts uh, but we can that's why we have to say you will get clarity maybe understanding maybe empathy Jim? yeah if i were uh rude and presumptuous enough to um edit jonathan hyde i would i would say uh, empathy is an antidote to insert self righteousness. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And when we go to the roots of the idea of righteousness, it's not about rectitude and, and moral correctness and spirituality and all the rest of that. The, the root of righteousness is about fair and equitable dealing. And most American religion has written that right out of the meaning of the word to turn it into something. Um, parsimonious and pedantic agree it's with me exactly the way i say it or you're wrong and and not just not just wrong intellectually but you were morally wrong sorry Mary, yes. like, go ahead. well no it's interesting you say that because when i read that that's what i actually read i didn't read right. righteousness i read self-righteousness in my like understanding so i i can't argue with that at all <laughs> i bet height would have accepted that if he had had a uh, a person editing him that had more um a broader view spiritually in some ways or more depth i bet that they would have picked up on that I, hmm. I'm, I, I'm almost certain that's what he meant right by the tone of his work so sure yeah yeah okay so this gets into some of the crux of i uh, in some of our trying to come up with framing questions in our base camp, I was playing with this whole idea of like, do we address the elephant in the room or not, right? And so I have a series of ideas here. And so I'm gonna go through them. And so you guys can think out loud with me here. So I have your attention and I knew I was gonna have your attention. So you're gonna brainstorm with me. <laughs> so. This is from Brene Brown's book. She says, people often silence themselves or agree to disagree without fully exploring the actual nature of the disagreement for the sake of protecting a relationship and maintaining connection. But when we avoid certain conversations and never fully learn how the other person feels about all of the issues, we sometimes end up making assumptions that deepen misunderstandings and that can generate resentment. Okay, so that's the first one. So in this quote, I'm getting the idea, don't ignore the elephant in the room, right? Okay. That's, and then a lot of people, how they handle their relationships is they do this. They just don't talk about it. And that's how they're able to maintain their relationships. They just do this. This popped up on Jordan Peterson's Facebook feed. I follow him on Facebook. You are not obligated to associate with people who are making your life worse. I think... I don't think any of this kind of goes back to that balance thing. Like, I want the right answer. Which one of these, they all seem to contradict each other. <laughs> I want the right one. But it seems like this is the thing that people have to figure out in their interactions with people. And it kind of depends on where they're at. It depends on the, where the other person is at. This is hard for me. <laughs> so anyway, well, I was curious hard... what you're... Well, it's a hard uh, thing of these is navigation points and trying to come to a decision. So uh, I, my baseline for this is something Edwin Friedman said that the work of a leader is to define yourself and stay connected. So the, the idea of I'm being me, I'm being clear about who I am, but I also have to stay connected to other human beings and even people with whom I disagree. So this just that to me is like baseline. It's like it's structurally how we're wired as human beings. Having said that, then. Um, you have this incredible responsibility slash uh, privilege of deciding at different times in your life. We each have to decide when it is that we want to talk about something that's uncomfortable. You know, we attempt to do that. And then we have to determine with the other person because it's not just you. It's, it's to be honest and be real about defining who you are. That other person has to respond. If they respond by silence uh, or not, I'm not ready yet, you know, then that's kind of, that's, that's a decision has been made, at least for the time being. But uh, I am, I am now of the opinion at my age, 
that there are some things in life that are, uh, when I say irreparable, uh, they're not going to get fixed. I think we have unrealistic expectations uh, about, ide we idealize relationships at times that this, this is going to get fixed and we can start working harder than our client. We can start working, uh, we can do as much as we want and nothing's really gonna change. This is a really tough call, particularly, you know, for those of us who say, well, Jesus has called us to love each other and even love our enemies. So clearly that's aspirational in my thinking. That's not like a command. Maybe it is a command, but I can't go there. You know, it's like, try and do this. Um, so those are the things I have to weigh inside my mind because ultimately I have to live with who I am and I have to be honest about who I am and own the fact that I've made wrong decisions at times about what I just said to you. I haven't always made the right decisions about that. But that's those are the navigation points that I navigate to get to the dilemma you're, I believe, I think I'm close to what you're yeah. talking about. Okay. I don't think there's a right answer. It's just, I'm, I'm curious well, what your thoughts you are. A lot of it is, I, what I'm looking for is, tell me how, how you navigate. I want, you know, I'm, I'm presuming you're being honest with me, right? So that being the case, <laughs> what have you even learned in life? Something's come with life, uh, stages of life. Yes. And, and so that, but not everything. And some things, um, and we're all different. We have tolerances for different things at different times. So I just want to know how people navigate stuff a lot. That helps me, you know, as it relates to the question you're asking. I spent an unexpected hour uh, today with an old friend who uh, in her 40s is uh, just about 10 days away from having dealt with something in a therapeutic situation with her entire family that she has known that she was going to deal with eventually since her teenage years when, when certain things happened uh, in her 20s when she began to uh, grapple with the fact that those things had indeed happened and were real and that sooner or later she was going to have to, to confront them for herself and in herself and the precipitating factor of her wrestling with those things in family therapy now is uh, is a teenager who is uh, wrestling with a different set of circumstances, but very similar adaptations and uh, emotions and um, practices in life. And her decision to accept the uh, therapist's invitation to uh, go ahead and get that bag unpacked now and uh, put it all out of the bed and take a look at it and decide what should be discarded and what should be mended and uh, what's just fine. Uh, was driven by her, her love for her family and, and this daughter who is so hurt and so angry and her own things, right? Um, there, aren't, there aren't very many things that we, um, that we get to do only once, when I, that, we, that we have only one shot at doing, say it that way. Um, there's a looping effect <laughs> in life where we either have to drink more to avoid doing something, right? Or we have to do the thing. We either have to throw ourselves more deeply into um, bombastic evangelical zeal for whatever our cause is and, and subsume everything else underneath that, or we have to do the work that's gonna be waiting for us when we get out the other side of that. Um, so much of addictive behavior can relatively easily be described as people um, finding ways to not deal with what's in, in front of them, to not feel what they're feeling, not see what they're seeing, and uh, to, to find something they can normalize temporarily un until, um, whose line was it? Was it, uh, was it uh, um, Tom York? Uh, the drugs don't work, they just make it worse. Um, so I, I, all that to say, yeah, yeah, you think you're done, <laughs> you're, you're not done. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for chatting. Hopefully um, when I talk about it now on my podcast, people can know what it is. Cause I've referenced three practices several times and now they can all know what it is and they can, oh, and I, 
I want to put references in the notes, so I'll probably put the website. Is there a place where people can watch the documentary? Is there anything else I can link? Yeah, it's all on the website. Uh, the no joke stuff is uh, under about us. There's a section on no joke and they can find uh, quite a bit of uh, stuff to watch there. And if they want more, they can drop us a note and we'll be happy to accommodate them. I'm going to give you one more, one more quote that, that you made me think of while we were going that you can play with uh, at your convenience. I was going to ask you to say this one out loud when we were talking. Yeah. Read it. Go ahead. Let the people hear it. Okay. Ray Bradbury is uh, thinking in 2001 back on the, the town in Ohio that raised him. The people there were gods and midgets and knew themselves mortal. And so the midgets walked tall so as not to embarrass the gods. And the gods crouched so as to make the small ones feel at home. And after all, isn't that what life is all about? The ability to go around back and come up inside other people's heads and look out at the damned full mir miracle and say, oh, so that's how you say it. Well, now, I must remember that. <laughs> Some nice ending for you, Marty Lynn. That is nice. All right. Well, I'll let you guys go. I've already stole your time. Thanks, friend. Lovely being yeah. with you. See you soon, huh?